linkage institutions, the institutions in American society that connect us with our government. They're a part of government, a part, not, not government itself. We talked about um, political parties, we talked about interest groups, and then we talked about elections. Today we're going to talk about our last linkage institution, our main linkage institution, the media. Um, remember that phrase over there, there is nothing more important to a democracy than a well-informed electorate. If the people that vote in your country are not able to make good decisions because they're not well informed, your democracy is going to fall apart. And the media plays a big role in informing the American electorate about issues, about candidates. That's their main job. That they're a linked institution, right? So they work to express our concerns, our needs, our wants to our government. That's what the media does. So that's what the media is supposed to do. So that government can make policies that will address those concerns and issues. The media in the United States had evolved over time. Um, back when we were forced to first born, we only had print media um, around the 1700s and the 1800s. And of course, as technology advanced, media also changed. At uh, the turn of the 20th century, we get radio and we get television, mass media that's able to reach a wider audience. And as a result, politicians and stakeholders in government have to adapt. Um, there's examples of this throughout American history, like FDR doing fireside chats to get support for the New Deal and get support for his wartime policies during World War II. Uh, you have Ronald Reagan going on TV talking about his tax cuts policies and getting public support for that. Oh, power through. Um, in the 1960s, it's like throwing a pebble into um, we a have the pond. first Our choices will go out to the world and things we don't always TV. understand. It was between How would we make the right candidate, choice? Um, William James, an American philosopher, would say, tell him to Nixon. live by a yes what's and no. What's special about yes, this debate is the, good, it's the first no, televised one in world history. How do we know what's good and what's bad? How do we know what's right and wrong? First, we listen to the wisdom of our teachers, parents, and grandparents. Or perhaps we'll have been heard the debate on the and then radio, second, we they actually to thought that Are you trying to make Nixon an important that choice in life? They thought he was able to Sit and be still, turn off the electronics, listen K. and remember these words. But people who watch it on TV for the first time... Let your conscience be your guide. With something to think about, this is Jane. And Ariana, Nixon looked make it a great day or not, the choice is yours. Nervous. He wasn't, he was Go sweating. Warriors! He wasn't shaved very well. Because of television, politics is going to be changed forever. Because what you look like, how you project yourself in front of people, that's going to matter more now. When it didn't used to matter, when we only had radio and we only had newspapers. TV news also arose around the 1970s, where we have the evening news and our local channels, usually at like 7 a.m. and at 7 p.m. And then in the 1980s, it's going to be on your exam, the public began to demand instantaneous news coverage. They began to demand instantaneous news coverage. Back in the olden days, if you want to hear about a story, you're going to have to tune in to your morning news or your evening news in your local channels. Um, but people began to demand news as it happens. So how did our um, television adapt to that? Today we have what? What do we have today? What are these? News stations. News stations, yes. But what are they? What makes them special? How do they meet that demand of instantaneous news coverage? But we don't have to wait anymore. Why? What are these networks? What's special about them? Sorry? That's true. What else? Guys, today, you don't have to wait at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. anymore to hear about the story, right? Because exactly, they're 24 hours. Well, write that down somewhere, quietly, please. That demand for instantaneous news, that was met by 24-hour news networks. Like CNN is the first one. And then you got MSNBC and Fox News. And then today, we have several 24-hour news networks because they had to meet this demand of instantaneous news coverage. Today, especially during um, your lifetime, we get the emergence of the internet and social media as people's sources for news. So we have websites today, 
that uh, that have news. Most of the newspapers are dying off, and they're moving to the internet. Uh, so we have blogs, and we have social media that talks about the news as well. This is probably the biggest change around the 2010s on how people consume the news. Before, people relied on traditional news media. So what do I mean by traditional news media? These three things. Newspapers, radio, and television. Today, your generation and my generation were moving away from traditional news media. A lot of these cable companies are struggling. A lot of newspapers are closing. And we're moving to non-traditional sources like the internet, social media. And that's probably going to continue more and more. All right, let's talk about the impact of the media on public policy, the functions of the media. Guys, on your exam next week, you need to know what all of these mean. You may be asked to describe what they mean. Make sure you know what they are. These are the functions of the media and how they affect what goes on in the United States and the public policy that our government makes. The first one is the gatekeeping or agenda setting function. The gatekeeping or the agenda setting function. So what does that mean? The media is the one that chooses which issues to cover and which issues not to cover. They're the ones that choose which issues to report on and which issues not to report on. So why is that, why is that important? Because whatever the media chooses to report on, that's get brought up to our consciousness, to the public consciousness. So we become aware of these issues. And as a result, we begin to demand government to respond to these issues, to act on these issues. So here's what I mean by this. There's a lot of issues that's facing the United States today, right? The media is the one that chooses which ones to cover and which ones not to cover. That's why it's called the gatekeeping functions. They're the ones that choose which issues are going to be brought up to the public consciousness. So let's say they don't talk about poverty, but they talk about gay rights. Gay rights would be more likely to be put on the, the policy agenda of the government because that's the one that we care about. The media affects which issues the public cares about and which issues we don't care about. Because if the media doesn't talk about an issue a lot, then we may not be aware of it or we may not care about it as much as issues that they do bring up. So again, it's called gatekeeping function because they're the ones that decide which issues our country is facing that gets brought up to our consciousness, to our awareness. It's also known as the agenda setting function of the media because that affects which issues are, are um, put onto the government's policy agenda, which issues the government chooses to act on. So essentially, if the media talks about a story a lot, that story gets brought up to our consciousness and it's more likely to be put on the government's agenda and government is more likely to respond to it and act on it with a policy. Does that make sense for everybody? That's why it's called agenda setting function and gatekeeping function, they mean the same thing. It's called gatekeeping because they choose which issues to cover or not to cover. It's called agenda setting because the issues that they choose to cover, those are more likely to be acted on by the government and put on their policy agenda. Make sense so far? Anyone confused? This is a very important function of the media. So the media chooses which issues to cover or not to cover. The media helps the government, uh, helps set the government's agenda. If they talk about an issue a lot, that issue is going to probably be put on the agenda. If they don't talk about it a lot, it's probably not going to be put on there because people are not aware of it, or we don't care, or we don't think it's, it's as important as the issues that they do care uh, talk about. Next, another important function of the media is the watchdog function of the media. A lot of people refer to the media as the fourth estate. They, it's a metaphor that the media is the fourth branch of the U.S. government, which is not true, but the media does serve a function of checking the people that are in government. It's called a watchdog function because the media tends to try to see corruption and incompetence in our government. They try to expose that corruption. They try to uncover and expose um, wrongdoings, abuse of power, incompetence, ignorance uh, that's happening in government. So they make our politicians more accountable because they know if I, if I was a politician, I know the media is going to try to expose me if I do something wrong or if I do something that is incompetent. So it is the media's tendency to seek and expose corruption and incompetence. Um, today, there, there's this called investigative journalism. 
where people or journalists use detective-like skills, detective-like skills to uncover corruption. So probably the best example of this is these two gentlemen over here, worked really hard to expose what went on in Watergate. And they were able to bring a presidency down. He was forced to resign because of investigative journalism. The Pentagon Papers, we talked about that in the United States versus um, the New York Times, or the New York Times versus the United States. So they use detective life skills to uncover corruption. What is the impact of investigative journalism and the watchdog function of the media? What happens to the public's trust? It's, we've grown to distrust government more and more. American public have grown to distrust government. Guys, if you look at all the polls, back then in the 1940s, the 1920s, most people liked their government back then. If you look at the polls, a lot of times people had a positive view of their government. And then the 1960s hit, and then the media started showing the Vietnam War, and the media exposed Watergate. And after that, things went down. Public opinion today about government is very low, especially Congress, and especially against the President of the United States. We've grown to distrust our government. That's partly because what the media has been doing, serving this watchdog function and exposing corruption and incompetence. Any questions about watchdog function? The third function of the media is horse race journalism. Horse race, this is how the media behaves during the election. This is a negative, by the way. Horse race journalism, when people talk about it, it's not, they don't talk about it in a positive way. This is how the media behaves during election time. During election time, the media focuses on and emphasizes the following things. Number one, they care about who's winning or losing. That's what they're caring about. They cover polls. It's about the horse race for them. And you're going to see this. Those of you that paid attention in 2020, maybe you didn't, maybe you did. CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News, they turn to like ESPN. They talk about the race itself. They talk about who's up in the polls and who's down in the polls. Whose campaign strategy is working and whose campaign strategy is not working. Who's appealing to African Americans and who's appealing to Hispanics. They talk about the game. They talk about the race itself, which is a negative. We'll talk about why in a little bit. So who's winning or losing? The poll numbers. Who's ahead? Who's falling behind? Who's winning Texas? Who's losing California? We talk about the campaign strategies, the day-to-day -day activities of a campaign, instead of what is actually important. What gets lost when it comes to horse race journalism are the issues that are important for the United States. They don't cover that as much, or at all. And uh, policy positions of the candidates. We don't get as informed. The media is supposed to inform us about the candidates, about the issues that we're facing, so that when we get to a voting booth, we can make educated decisions on what's best for us and what's best for the country. But because of the, the media's obsession with the horse race, with who's winning and losing campaign strategies, that gets lost along the way. That's why today, a lot of people, a lot of American voters, they go to the voting booth not knowing what's best for them, which candidate is best for them. Because the media is not serving its function of informing them of what's important. Remember, the most important thing to a democracy is a well-informed electorate. And if that voting population is not well-informed, a democracy can be brought down. So the impact of horse race journalism, electorate is less informed about the issues, about the candidates. Elections turn into popularity contests, who's winning and losing. And remember, that has an impact because of the bandwagon effect. If they constantly show polls and this guy is ahead and people have supported this guy, people are more likely to support that person because he's popular or an issue because they're popular. So horse race journalism, the preoccupation, the obsession of the media to cover the game, the horse race, instead of what's actually important for the American voter during election time. Guys, you're going to see this in 2024. I know most of you will participate in 2024. Watch the news. You're going to see horse race journalism. It becomes like ESPN. They have graphs. They have fancy uh, maps talking about the horse race. All right. The nature of democratic policy debates and level of political uh, knowledge among citizens is impacted by the following factors. 
for one. Today, we have an increase of media sources, an increase in media sources. Today, like I told you, we don't only have traditional news, your grandparents and your parents got their information from. Today, we have the internet, and most especially, we have social media today for our information. I know a lot of you who are more politically conscious, most of you probably don't read the newspaper. You probably don't watch the um, TV news. Instead, you turn to social media, you turn to the internet for your information. The younger you are, the more likely you are to do that. There's this thing called citizen journalism. Today, everybody has a smartphone, so everybody can be a journalist. They can document, they can cover. But here's the problem with this. And this is something that you guys are gonna have to face more and more. When your parents and grandparents were growing up, using and getting their information traditional in the media, most of the time, that's reliable information. But today, we have so many sources of news, we don't know which one is reliable, which one we can trust. Anybody with a smartphone can report on something, but we don't know whether or not it's true or not true. So our problem today as a modern day society is, even though we have more sources of news, which could be a good thing, it is also a bad thing because there's less reliability in the news. So concerns about the reliability of the news today. All right, this is another important one, the rise of media conglomerates rise of media conglomerates. Around the 1900s, newspapers uh, were getting bought up by companies, and those companies eat local newspapers, like the Monitor, for example. And then those companies become bigger. And then when radio stations came about and television networks came about, those companies bought those smaller ones, and they become bigger and bigger. Today, you should know this, because this is a fact. Most of our local news, most of our traditional news sources like local newspapers, local radio, and local television, they're owned by the same company. They're called media conglomerates. One company in the United States owns a lot of the local news networks, the local stations in the United States. So media conglomerates are these big companies that own a lot of our traditional news sources. So, giant media conglomerates. This is like Disney owning most of the uh, entertainment industry. Most of our local news networks today are owned by the same companies. There's only a few companies in the United States that actually own most of the local networks in the United States. Now, why is that a problem? This is a problem because there's a similarity in news coverage today. What gets covered in local stations here in McAllen is probably being covered the same way in Oklahoma. We don't get variety. Decrease in diversity of political opinion that is being, um, I'm not sure what I was gonna put there. Here's what you should make. I'm not sure what we should put there, but since these media companies, these conglomerates, own most of the news networks, they can dictate what news to report on and how they will report the news. And in that way, they can affect public opinion. We talked about the agenda setting function, we talked about gatekeeping. Companies today dictate what most of the, these big companies dictate what most of the local news networks are going to report on. And they have an impact on what we believe, they have an impact on public opinion. That's scary, because public opinion today, especially if your grandparents and your parents, they turn to the local news networks for their sources of information. Those big media companies are the ones that dictate what gets reported on and how they get reported on, so they have an impact on what your parents believe and what your grandparents believe. They can control it. They can control public opinion by their choice of what to cover and not to cover. And again, because most of these local news networks, newspapers, radio stations are owned by the same companies, that's dictated by these multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar media conglomerates. So huge corporate entities have control of what information is being presented, giving them a lot of influence over public opinion. All right, one of these media conglomerates, guys, is a company called Sinclair. I'm gonna give you an example of how this works. 
they own a lot of the news networks, local news stations around the United States. San Antonio's Jessica Headley. And I'm Ryan Wolf. Our latest responsibility is, is to serve our Treasure Valley communities, the El Paso Las Cruces communities, Eastern Iowa communities, Mid Michigan communities. We are extremely proud of the quality, balanced journalism that CBS4 News produces. But we are concerned about the country, plaguing our country. The sharing of biased and false news has become all too common on social media. More alarming, some media outlets publish the same fake stories without checking facts first. The sharing of biased and false, false news has become all too common on social media. More alarming, some media This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 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 This is extreme. So the irony is they're warning people about how fake news can affect public opinion, but this is Sinclair using their control of the local media stations that they own to control American public opinion. That's happening in the United States today. Thankfully though, fortunately, again, the trend is we're rejecting these traditional news sources today. More and more people, like people of your age, are turning to non-traditional sources for media. So the control of these media conglomerates today are decreasing. As more and more of you are turning off your television, not reading the newspaper, and not tuning into the radio uh, for your source of information, their power, their control over public opinion in the United States has decreased over the years. So the availability of news searches such as social media, means we're less reliant on traditional media, which means less influence for these media conglomerates. Alright. Alright guys. Another thing you need to remember is money influences the media a lot. Also these media networks are businesses they have one goal and they're profit driven. That is profit. They want to earn money. How does a radio station, how does a website, or how does a television network, how do they earn money? Ads, advertising. The more viewership you have, the higher the ratings your television network or your radio network have, the more you can charge for advertising. That's a big problem when it comes to our media today. Because they rely a lot on advertising, they need to show you what's going not necessarily what is important or what is valuable to the American voter. They need to show you what is entertaining, what's going to draw the most people to watch their television show. So here's what I want you um, um, to know today. News is largely consumer driven today. They show you what we want to see. Because guys, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, they're in the same business as Spongebob and Nickelodeon. They want to show you what you want to see so that you can tune in, so that they can earn ad, uh, ad revenue. But guys, what we want to see is not necessarily what's important, but what's valuable to us as American voters. So news is largely consumer driven today. A lot of people like accuse the media of being conservative and being liberal. <coughs> There's certainly truth to that, as we'll talk about it in a little bit, but if you're looking for the real bias of the news, when it comes to giving, if they have two choices, a story that is valuable to the American voter, informational to the American voter, or a story that's going to get a lot of people to watch, uh, that's going to garner a wide audience, they will choose the entertaining story each and every time. That's the real bias of the news. That's the real sin of the news. I'll give you an example. In 2013, the Obama administration was in the process of negotiating a trade treaty 
uh, with Asian countries. It's called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The consequences of this treaty is going to affect a lot of American families. It could mean you losing your job. It could mean you getting a job. It has severe consequences for American people, for the American voter. Unfortunately, this didn't get covered a lot in the media, or didn't get covered at all in the media. Why? Because at the same time TPP was being negotiated, a former congressman in the House of Representatives uh, was caught sending nude pictures to people, to women that was not his wife. He was cheating. And pictures were spread all over the news. Ironically, his name is Anthony Lehman. So what happened? Which, which one did the media cho choose to cover? They covered the Wiener story. Guys, two weeks of my life, 20 minutes, every news station, every news network, every news show, I saw the picture of this guy's junk. Because each and every time, they will choose the entertaining story, the conflict-driven story, the dramatic story, than what is actually informational and valuable to the American voter so that we can make good decisions when we're voting. And I don't want to harp on the news too much, guys. If you're looking for somebody to blame, look into a mirror. Because this is what they're supposed to do. Their businesses are supposed to earn money. If we would watch things that are informational and valuable, that's what they're going to show. But we don't want that. If you're honest with yourself, most of you would probably watch the Wiener story as well. All right. Another consequence is consumer-driven nature of the media, of the media only showing what consumers want, want to actually watch, is the rise of partisan media or biased media. Most of our media sources today, guys, have uh, ideological slant. They tailor their programming and they tailor their news coverage to a certain demographic, whether it be liberals, Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, they tailor their programming towards a certain why. In the early 2000s, Fox News Network did something or figured out something that people are going to copy. Fox News figured out we don't really want the news. We don't really want to be presented with facts. What we want is for people to agree with what we already believe in. So here's what Fox News did. It started tailoring its programming towards conservatives and Republicans. It worked. Look at the ratings. Even today, Fox News is number one out of all the 24 hours news networks because they start tailoring their pro programming towards a certain ideology. Why, guys? Because in psychology, there's this thing called confirmation bias. We enjoy it. We get a certain feeling of satisfaction when we're presented with information that confirms what we already believe in, what we already know, or what we already think is correct. So if I was a conservative watching Fox News, they're always agreeing with what I already believe in. It get my, my beliefs, my ideology get confirmed. I get a certain satisfaction out of that. This is why consumer-driven media has, uh, has led to partisan media. And other news networks, websites, radio stations, started doing the same thing. So today, Fox News is very conservative, and MSNBC and CNN are more liberal. You got news websites like Huffington Post. Anybody know what? How think the post is? They're more liberal. You get um, news networks like Breitbart, OAN, Newsmark. These are extremely conservative. Because again, guys, confirmation bias is human psychology. We like getting presented with information that agree with us. All right. So what is the impact of partisan and biased media in American politics? Guys, this is what you need to know. Because today, media is consumer driven, which means they like to show us what we want to watch. That led to partisan media, which means they tailor their programming towards a certain ideology. And that leads to the polarization of America, which means today, people are so widely divided in terms of what they believe in. Liberals are to the left and conservatives are to the right. We have less common ground and we have less understanding with each other. Guys, back in the 1960s and 1940s, Americans generally 
have the same political ideology. They may be a little to the left, a little to the right, but they have a lot of things that they can agree with. Today, that's not the case anymore. We have we don't have a lot of agreement, we don't have a lot of common ground, and that's the result of being presented with information only to one side of an ideology. So we are not presented with facts or arguments from the other side. Because again, we don't want that. We don't want to be challenged. We don't want facts that disagree with what we already believe in. We're not going to watch if that's the case. There's this echo chamber that gets created, that people get to um, choose their facts Guys, you're not supposed to choose your facts. The media is supposed to present you with facts. But today, we can choose our facts. If I was a conservative, I'll go to Fox News. If I was a liberal, I'll go to CNN. We can choose our facts today. The media is supposed to present us with facts. Today, we can shop for facts. There's a lack of objectivity, a demonization of the other side, like the other side is evil, the other side is wrong, So now we have less understanding, we have less common ground. So that led to the polarization of the United States. The country became more polarized and radicalized. It also means, guys, that people like us, like uh, voters, because they're more radicalized, they're more extreme in their ideologies, they elect people who are also more extreme in their ideologies. What does that mean? Look what happened in Congress. I know I saw you guys saw this graph on one of your uh, your tests before. Look what's happening between Democrats and Republicans in the United States, right? 1994. There's a lot of common ground right there. But look what it is today. Not a lot of common ground anymore. People are becoming more extreme in their ideology because again, they're bombarded with things that they already agree with. Partisan media, biased media. <clears throat> As a result, we elect politicians who are the same way, who are very liberal, who are very conservative. What does that mean, guys? What happens if we start electing representatives to the House, the Senate, presidents, who are very extreme in their ideology? It's difficult to make policy. Guys, the Constitution was written with the idea that people have to work together to create policy. Senate, House of Representatives, the President, they have to work together. But if people have less things in common, they have their beliefs are so extreme with each other, our Constitution doesn't work. It gets broken. Policy making in the United States becomes more and more difficult as people become more and more polarized. It is estimated that today we're more divided than ever before, ever since the Civil War. The Civil War was when Americans actually killed one another. That's how divided this country is, and that's, the media is partly to blame for that because of their tendency to report and to gear their programming towards a certain ideology. All right, like I told you before, non-traditional sources of media are not as reliable as traditional media. Guys, even though you know, there's a lot of problems with radio, television news, and newspapers. There's a lot of problems with them today. Um, they're still more reliable than non-traditional sources like social media. Um, they have sources. Most of their reporting is well-sourced. Most of those journalists that work there are still have integrity. They still have honesty. But as more and more people are leaving those traditional sources of media and turning to social media and the Internet for their information, that information is less reliable. We don't know if it's factual or not. And I don't know if you've been turning into the news, but today social media, the information being propagated in social media, is largely affected by um, foreign countries. So some propag propagated by foreign countries like China and Russia are enemies. So as a result of all of this, guys, there is a growing distrust of the media. There's a growing distrust. Look at uh, people your age and people who are older. It doesn't matter. Over the years, we've come to trust the media less and less because of all the things that we talked about, the media conglomerates, partisan media. 
All right, guys. Anyone have any questions so far? All right. Congratulations. That was AP government. That was our last lesson on AP government. Now.